Chapters 54 and 55 of The Golden Bough. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser. Chapter 54. Types of Animal Sacrament. 1. The Egyptian and the Aino Types of Sacrament. We are now perhaps in a position to understand the ambiguous behavior of the Aino and Gilyaks toward the bear. It has been shown that the sharp line of demarcation which we draw between mankind and the lower animals does not exist for the savage. To him many of the other animals appear as his equals or even his superiors, not merely in brute force but in intelligence, and if choice or necessity leads him to take their lives, he feels bound, out of regard to his own safety, to do it in a way which will be as inoffensive as possible, not merely to the living animal, but to its departed spirit, and to all the other animals of the same species, which would descend an affront put upon one of their kind, much as a tribe of savages would revenge an injury or insult offered to a tribesman. We have seen that among the many devices by which the savage seeks to atone for the wrong done by him to his animal victims, one is to show marked deference to a few chosen individuals of the species, for such behavior is apparently regarded as entitling him to exterminate with impunity all the rest of the species upon which he can lay hands. This principle perhaps explains the attitude, at first sight puzzling and contradictory, of the Aino towards the bear. The flesh and skin of the bear regularly affords them food and clothing, but since the bear is an intelligent and powerful animal, it is necessary to offer some satisfaction or atonement to the bear species for the loss which it sustains in the death of so many of its members. This satisfaction or atonement is made by rearing young bears, treating them, so long as they live, with respect, and killing them with extraordinary marks of sorrow and devotion. So the other bears are appeased, and do not resent the slaughter of their kind by attacking the slayers or deserting the country, which would deprive the Aino of one of their means of subsistence. Thus the primitive worship of animals conforms to two types, which are in some respects the converse of each other. On the one hand, animals are worshipped, and are therefore neither killed nor eaten. On the other hand, animals are worshipped because they are habitually killed and eaten. In both types of worship the animal is revered on account of some benefit, positive or negative, which the savage hopes to receive from it. In the former worship, the benefit comes either in the positive shape of protection, advice, and help, which the animal affords the man, or in the negative shape of abstinence from injuries, which it is in the power of the animal to inflict. In the latter worship, the benefit takes the material form of the animal's flesh and skin. The two types of worship are in some measure antithetical. In the one, the animal is not eaten because it is revered. In the other, it is revered because it is eaten. But both may be practiced by the same people, as we see in the case of North American Indians, who, while they apparently revere and spare their totem animals, also revere the animals and fish upon which they subsist. The Aborigines of Australia have totemism in the most primitive form known to us, but there is no clear evidence that they attempt, like the North American Indians, to conciliate the animals which they kill and eat. The means which the Australians adopt to secure a plentiful supply of game appear to be primarily based, not on conciliation, but on sympathetic magic, a principle to which the North American Indians also resort for the same purpose. Hence, as the Australians undoubtedly represent a ruder and earlier stage of human progress than the American Indians, it would seem that before hunters think of worshipping the game as a means of ensuring an abundant supply of it, they seek to attain the same end by sympathetic magic. This again would show, what there is good reason for believing, that sympathetic magic is one of the earliest means by which man endeavors to adapt the agencies of nature to his needs. Corresponding to the two distinct types of animal worship, there are two distinct types of the custom of killing the animal god. On the one hand, when the revered animal is habitually spared, it is nevertheless killed, and sometimes eaten, on rare and solemn occasions. Examples of this custom have been already given, and an explanation of them offered. On the other hand, when the revered animal is habitually killed, 
the slaughter of any one of the species involves the killing of the god, and is atoned for on the spot by apologies and sacrifices, especially when the animal is a powerful and dangerous one. And, in addition to this ordinary and everyday atonement, there is a special annual atonement at which a select individual of the species is slain with extraordinary marks of respect and devotion. Clearly, the two types of sacramental killing, the Egyptian and the Aino types, as we may call them for distinction, are liable to be confounded by an observer, and, before we can say to which type any particular example belongs, it is necessary to ascertain whether the animal sacramentally slain belongs to a species which is habitually spared, or to one which is habitually killed by the tribe. In the former case, the example belongs to the Egyptian type of sacrament, in the latter to the Aino type. The practice of pastoral tribes appears to furnish examples of both types of sacrament. Pastoral tribes, says Adolf Bastian, being sometimes obliged to sell their herds to strangers who may handle the bones disrespectfully, seek to avert the danger which such a sacrilege would entail by consecrating one of the herd as an object of worship, eating it sacramentally in the family circle with closed doors, and afterwards treating the bones with all the ceremonious respect which, strictly speaking, should be accorded to every head of cattle, but which, being punctually paid to the representative animal, is deemed to be paid to all. Such family meals are found amongst various peoples, especially those in the Caucasus. When amongst the Absasis, the shepherds in spring eat their common meal, with their loins girt and their staves in their hands, this may be looked upon both as a sacrament and as an oath of mutual help and support. For the strongest of all oaths is that which is accompanied with the eating of a sacred substance, since the perjured person cannot possibly escape the avenging god whom he has taken into his body and assimilated. This kind of sacrament is of the Aino or expiatory type, since it is meant to atone to the species for the possible ill usage of individuals. An expiation, similar in principle but different in details, is offered by the Kalmuks to the sheep, whose flesh is one of their staple foods. Rich Kalmuks are in the habit of consecrating a white ram under the title the Ram of Heaven, or the Ram of the Spirit. The animal is never shorn and never sold, but when it grows old and its owner wishes to consecrate a new one, the old ram must be killed and eaten at a feast to which the neighbors are invited. On a lucky day, generally in autumn when the sheep are fat, a sorcerer kills the old ram, after sprinkling it with milk, its flesh is eaten, the skeleton, with a portion of the fat is burned on a turf altar, and the skin, with the head and feet, is hung up. An example of the sacrament of the Egyptian type is furnished by the Todas, a pastoral people of southern India, who subsist largely upon the milk of their buffaloes. Among them, the buffalo is to a certain degree held sacred, and is treated with great kindness, even with a degree of adoration, by the people. They never eat the flesh of the cow buffalo, and as a rule abstain from the flesh of the male. But to the latter rule there is a single exception. Once a year all the adult males of the village join in the ceremony of killing and eating a very young male calf, seemingly under a month old. They take the animal into the dark recesses of the village wood, where it is killed with a club made from the sacred tree of the Todas, the Millingtonia. A sacred fire having been made by the rubbing of sticks, the flesh of the calf is roasted on the embers of certain trees, and is eaten by the men alone, women being excluded from the assembly. This is the only occasion on which the Todas eat buffalo flesh. The Madi or Moru tribe of Central Africa, whose chief wealth is their cattle, though they also practice agriculture, appear to kill a lamb sacramentally on certain solemn occasions. The custom is thus described by Dr. Felkin. A remarkable custom is observed at stated times. Once a year, I am led to believe. I have not been able to ascertain what exact meaning is attached to it. It seems, however, to relieve the people's minds, for beforehand they evince much sadness, and seem very joyful when the ceremony is duly accomplished. The following is what takes place. A large concourse of people of all ages assemble, and sit down round a table of stones, which is erected by the side of a road, really a narrow path. A very choice lamb is then fetched by a boy, who leads it four times round the assembled people. As it passes, they pluck off little bits of its fleece and place them in their hair, 
or on some other part of their body. The lamb is then led up the stu- the lamb is then led up to the stones, and they are killed by a man belonging to a kind of priestly order, who takes some of the blood and sprinkles it four times over the people. He then applies it individually. On the children he makes a small ring of blood on the lower end of the breastbone. On women and girls he makes a mark above their breasts, and the men he touches on each shoulder. He then proceeds to explain the ceremony, and to exhort the people to show kindness. On this discourse, which is at times of great length, is over. The people rise, each places a leaf on or by the circle of stones, and they then depart with signs of great joy. The lamb's skull is hung on a tree near the stones, and its flesh is eaten by the poor. This ceremony is observed on a small scale at other times. If a family is in any great trouble, through illness or bereavement, their friends and neighbors come together and the lamb is killed. This is thought to avert further evil. The same custom prevails at the grave of departed friends, and also on joyful occasions, such as the return of a son home after a very prolonged absence. The sorrow thus manifested by the people at the annual slaughter of the lamb seems to show that the lamb slain is a sacred or divine animal, whose death is mourned by his worshippers, just as the death of the sacred buzzard was mourned by the Californians, and the death of the Theban ram by the Egyptians. The smearing each of the worshippers with the blood of the lamb is a form of communion with the divinity. The vehicle of the divine life is applied externally instead of being taken internally, as when the blood is drunk or the flesh eaten. 2. Processions with Sacred Animals The form of communion, in which a sacred animal is taken from house to house, that all may enjoy a share of its divine influence, has been exemplified by the Gilead custom of promenading the bear through the village before it is slain. A similar form of communion with the sacred snake is observed by a snake tribe in the Punjab. Once a year in the month of September, the snake is worshipped by all castes and religions for nine days only. At the end of August, the Mirasans, especially those of the snake tribe, make a snake of dough which they paint black and red and place on a winnowing basket. This basket they carry round the village, and on entering any house they say, God be with you all, may every ill be far. May our patrons, Guga's word, thrive. Then they present the basket with the snake, saying, A small cake of flour, a little bit of butter. If you obey the snake, you and yours shall thrive. Strictly speaking, a cake and butter should be given, but it is seldom done. Every one, however, gives something, generally a handful of dough or some corn. In houses where there is a new bride, or whence the bride has gone, or where a son has been born, it is usual to give a rupee and a quarter, or some cloth. Sometimes the bearers of the snake also sing, Give the snake a piece of cloth, and he will send a lively bride. When every house has been thus visited, the dough snake is buried, and a small grave is erected over it. Thither, during the nine days of September, the women come for worship. They bring a basin of curds, a small portion of which they offer at the snake's grave, kneeling on the ground and touching the earth with their foreheads. Then they go home and divide the rest of the curds among the children. Here the dough snake is clearly a substitute for a real snake. Indeed, in districts where snakes abound, the worship is offered, not at the grave of the dough snake, but in the jungles where snakes are known to be. Besides this yearly worship, performed by all the people, the members of the snake tribe worship in the same way every morning after a new moon. The snake tribe is not uncommon in the Punjab. Members of it will not kill a snake, and they say that its bite does not hurt them. If they find a dead snake, they put clothes on it and give it a regular funeral. Ceremonies closely analogous to this Indian worship of the snake have survived in Europe into recent times, and doubtless date from a very primitive paganism. The best known example is the hunting of the wren. By many European peoples, the ancient Greeks and Romans, the modern Italians, Spaniards, French, Germans, Dutch, Danes, Swedes, English, and Welsh. The wren has been designated the king, the little king, the king of birds, the hedge king, and so forth, and has been reckoned amongst those birds which it is extremely unlucky to kill. In England it is supposed that if any one kills a wren or harries its nest, he will infallibly break a bone or meet with some dreadful misfortune within the year, Sometimes it is thought that the cows will give bloody milk. In Scotland, the wren is called the Lady of Heaven's Hen, 
and boys say, Malisons, Malisons, mere than ten, that harry the lady of heaven's hen. At St. Donan in Brittany, people believe that if children touch the young wrens in the nest, they will suffer from the fire of St. Lawrence, that is, from pimples on the face, legs, and so on. In other parts of France, it is thought that if a person kills a wren or harries its nest, his house will be struck by lightning, or that the fingers with which he did the deed will shrivel up and drop off, or at least be maimed, or that his cattle will suffer in their feet. Notwithstanding such beliefs, the custom of annually killing the wren has prevailed widely both in this country and in France. In the Isle of Man, down to the 18th century, the custom was observed on Christmas Eve, or rather Christmas morning. On the 24th of December, towards the evening, all the servants got a holiday. They did not go to bed all night, but rambled about till the bells rang in the churches at midnight. When the prayers were over, they went to hunt the wren, and having found one of these birds, they killed it and fastened it to the top of a long pole, with its wings extended. Thus they carried it in procession to every house, chanting the following rhyme. We hunted the wren for Robin the Bobbin, we hunted the wren for Jack of the Can, we hunted the wren for Robin the Bobbin, we hunted the wren for every one. When they had gone from house to house and collected all the money they could, they led the wren on a bier and carried it in procession to the parish churchyard, where they made a grave and buried it with the utmost solemnity, singing dirges over her in the Manx language, which they call her knell, after which Christmas begins. The burial over, the company outside the churchyard formed a circle and danced the music. A writer of the 18th century says that in Ireland the wren is still hunted and killed by the peasants on Christmas Day, and on the following, St. Stephen's Day, he is carried about, hung by the leg, in the centre of two hoops, crossing each other at right angles, and a procession made in every village of men, women, and children, singing an Irish catch, importing him to be the king of all birds. Down to the present time, the hunting of the wren still takes place in parts of Leinster and Connaught. On Christmas Day, or St. Stephen's Day, the boys hunt and kill the wren, fasten it in the middle of a mass of holly and ivy on the top of a broomstick, and on St. Stephen's Day go about with it from house to house singing, The wren, the wren, the king of all birds, St. Stephen's Day was caught in the firs, although he is little, his family is great, I pray you, good landlady, give us a treat. Money or food, bread, butter, eggs, etc., are given them, upon which they feasted in the evening. In the first half of the 19th century, similar customs were still observed in various parts of the south of France. Thus, at Carcassonne, every year on the first Sunday of December, the young people of the street St. Jean used to go out of the town armed with sticks, with which they beat the bushes looking for rents. The first to strike down one of these birds was proclaimed king, then they returned to the town in procession, headed by the king, who carried the wren on a pole. On the evening of the last day of the year, the king and all those who had hunted the wren marched through the streets of the town to the light of torches, with drums beating and fives playing in front of them. At the door of every house they stopped, and one of them wrote with chalk on the door, Vive le roi, with the number of the year which was about to begin. On the morning of twelfth day, the king again marched in procession with great pomp, wearing a crown and a blue mantle, and carrying a sceptre. In front of him was borne the wren fastened to the top of a pole, which was adorned with a verdant wreath of olive, of oak, and sometimes of mistletoe grown on an oak. After hearing high mass in the parish church of St. Vincent, surrounded by his officers and guards, the king visited the bishop, the mayor, the magistrates, and the chief inhabitants, collecting money to defray the expenses of the royal banquet, which took place in the evening, and wound up with a dance. The parallelism between this custom of hunting the wren and some of those which we have considered, especially the Gilliac procession with the bear and the Indian one with the snake, seems too close to allow us to doubt that they all belong to the same circle of ideas. The worshipful animal is killed with special solemnity once a year, and before or immediately after death he is promenaded from door to door that each of his worshippers may receive a portion of divine virtues that are supposed to emanate from the dead or dying god. Religious processions of this sort must have had a great place in the ritual of European peoples in prehistoric times, if we may judge from the numerous traces of them which have survived in folk custom. For example, on the last day of the year, or Hogmanay as it was called, it used to be customary in the highlands of Scotland for a man to dress himself up in a cow's hide 
and thus attired, to go from house to house, attended by young fellows, each of them armed with a staff, to which a bit of raw hide was tied. Round every house, the hide-clad man used to run thrice, deisel, that is, according to the course of the sun, so as to keep the house on his right hand, while the others pursued him, beating the hide with their staves, and thereby making a loud noise like the beating of a drum. In this disorderly procession they also struck the walls of the house. On being admitted, one of the party, standing within the threshold, pronounced the blessing on the family in these words, May God bless the house, and all that belongs to it, cattle, stones, and timber, in plenty of meat, of bed and body clothes, and health of men may it ever abound. Then each of the party singed in the fire a little bit of the hide which was tied to his staff, and having done so, he applied the singed hide to the nose of every person and of every domestic animal belonging to the house. This was imagined to secure them from diseases and other misfortunes, particularly from witchcraft, throughout the ensuing year. The whole ceremony was called Kallun, because of the great noise made in beating the hide. It was observed in the Hebrides, including St. Kilda, down to the second half of the 18th century at least, and it seems to have survived well into the 19th century. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 The Transference of Evil 1. The Transference to Inanimate Objects We have now traced the practice of killing a god among peoples in the hunting, pastoral, and agricultural stages of society and I have attempted to explain the motives which led men to adopt so curious a custom. One aspect of the custom still remains to be noticed. The accumulated misfortunes and sins of a whole people are sometimes laid upon the dying god, who is supposed to bear them away forever, leaving the people innocent and happy. The notion that we can transfer our guilt and sufferings to some other beings who will bear them for us is familiar to the savage mind, it arises from a very obvious confusion between the physical and the mental, between the material and the immaterial. Because it is possible to shift a load of wood, stones, or what not, from our own back to the back of another, the savage fancies that it is equally possible to shift the burden of his pains and sorrows to another, who will suffer them in his stead. Upon this idea he acts, and the result is an endless number of very unamiable devices, for palming off upon someone else the trouble which a man shrinks from bearing himself. In short, the principle of vicarious suffering is commonly understood and practiced by races who stand on a low level of social and intellectual culture. In the following pages, I shall illustrate the theory and the practice as they are found among savages in all their naked simplicity, undisguised by the refinements of metaphysics and the subtleties of theology. The devices to which the cunning and selfish savage resorts for the sake of easing himself at the expense of his neighbor are manifold. Only a few typical examples of a multitude can be cited. At the outset, it is to be observed that the evil of which a man seeks to rid himself need not be transferred to a person. It may equal well be transferred to an animal or a thing, though in the last case the thing is often only a vehicle to convey the trouble to the first person who touches it. In some of the East Indian islands, they think that epilepsy can be cured by striking the patient on the face with the leaves of certain trees, and then throwing them away. The disease is believed to have passed into the leaves, and to have been thrown away with them. To cure toothache, some of the Australian blacks apply a heated spear-thrower to the cheek. The spear-thrower is then cast away, and the toothache goes with it in the shape of a black stone called carriage. Stones of this kind are found in old mounds and sand hills. They are carefully collected and thrown in the direction of enemies in order to give them toothache. The Bahima, a pastoral tribe of Uganda, often suffer from deep-seated abscesses. Their cure for this is to transfer disease to some other person by obtaining herbs from the medicine man, rubbing them over the place where their swelling is, and burying them in the road where people continually pass. The first person who steps over these buried herbs contracts the disease, and the original patient recovers. Sometimes, in case of sickness, the malady is transferred to an effigy as a preliminary to passing it on to a human being. Thus, among the Baganda, the medicine man would sometimes make a model of his patient in clay. Then a relative of the sick man would rub the image over the sufferer's body, and either bury it in the road, 
or in the grass by the wayside. The first person who stepped over the image or passed by it would catch the disease. Sometimes the effigy was made out of a plantain flower, tied up so as to look like a person. It was used in the same way as the clay figure. But the use of images for this malefic purpose was a capital crime. Any person caught in the act of burying one of them in the public road would surely have been put to death. In the western district of the island of Timor, where men and women are making long and tiring journeys, they fan themselves with leafy branches, which they afterwards throw away on particular spots where their forefathers did the same before them. The fatigue which they felt is thus supposed to have passed into the leaves and to be left behind. Others use stones instead of leaves. Similarly, in the Babar archipelago, tired people will strike themselves with stones, believing that they thus transfer to the stones the weariness which they felt in their own bodies. Then they throw away the stones in places which are specially set apart for the purpose. A like belief and practice in many distant parts of the world have given rise to these cairns or heaps of sticks and leaves, which travellers often observe beside the path, and to which every passing native adds his contribution in the shape of a stone, or stick, or leaf. Thus, in the Solomon and Banks Islands, the natives are wont to throw sticks, stones, or leaves upon a heap at a place of steep descent, or where a difficult path begins, saying, There goes my fatigue. The act is not a religious rite, for the thing thrown on the heap is not an offering to spiritual powers, and the words which accompany the act are not a prayer. It is nothing but a magical ceremony for getting rid of fatigue, which the simple savage fancies he can embody in a stick, leaf, or stone, and so cast it from him. 2. Transference to Animals Animals are often employed as a vehicle for carrying away or transferring the evil. When a moor has a headache, he will sometimes take a lamb or a goat and beat it till it falls down, believing that the headache will thus be transferred to the animal. In Morocco, most wealthy moors keep a wild boar in their stables, in order that the jinn and evil spirits may be diverted from the horses and enter into the boar. Among the Kafirs of South Africa, when other remedies have failed, natives sometimes adopt the custom of taking a goat into the, the presence of the sick man and confess the sins of the kraal over the animal. Sometimes a few drops of blood from the sick man are allowed to fall on the head of the goat, which is turned out into an uninhibited part of the veldt. The sickness is supposed to be transferred to the animal, and to become lost in the desert. In Arabia, when the plague is raging, the people will sometimes lead a camel through all the quarters of the town in order that the animal may take the pestilence on itself. Then they strangle it in a sacred place, and imagine that they have rid themselves of the camel and of the plague at one blow. It is said that when smallpox is raging, the savages of Formosa will drive the demon of the disease into a sow, then cut off the animal's ears and burn them or it, believing that in this way they rid themselves of the plague. Among the Malagasy, the vehicle for carrying away evils is called the Faditra. The Faditra is anything selected by the Sikidi, divining board, for the purpose of taking away hurtful evils or diseases that might prove injurious to an individual's happiness, peace, or prosperity. The faditra may be either ashes, cut money, a sheep, a pumpkin, or anything else the sikidi may choose to direct. After the particular article is appointed, the priest counts upon it all the evils that may prove injurious to the person for whom it is made, and which he then charges the faditra to take away forever. If the faditra be ashes, it is blown to be carried away by the wind. If it be cut money, it is thrown to the bottom of deep water, or where it can never be found. If it be a sheep, it is carried away to a distance on the shoulders of a man, who runs with all his might, mumbling as he goes, as if in the greatest rage against the faditra, for the evils it is bearing away. If it be a pumpkin, it is carried on the shoulders to a little distance, and there dashed upon the ground with every appearance of fury and indignation. A Malagasy was informed by a diviner that he was doomed to a bloody death, but that possibly he might avert his fate by performing a certain rite. Carrying a small vessel full of blood upon his head, he was to mount upon the back of a bullock. While thus mounted, he was to spill the blood upon the bullock's head, and then send the animal away into the wilderness, whence it might never return. The Bataks of Sumatra have a ceremony which they call making the curse to fly away. When a woman is childless, 
A sacrifice is offered to the gods of three grasshoppers, representing a head of cattle, a buffalo, and a horse. Then a swallow is set free, with a prayer that the curse may fall upon the bird and fly away with it. The entrance into a house of an animal, which does not generally seek to share the abode of man, is regarded by the Malays as ominous of misfortune. If a wild bird flies into a house, it must be carefully caught and smeared with oil, and must then be released in the open air, a formula being recited, in which it is forbidden to fly away with all the ill luck and misfortunes of the occupier. In antiquity, Greek women seem to have done the same with swallows, which they caught in the house. They poured oil on them, and let them fly away, apparently for the purpose of removing ill luck from the household. The Husuls of the Carpathians imagine that they can transfer freckles to the first swallow they see in spring, by washing their face in flowing water and saying, Swallow, swallow, take my freckles, and give me rosy cheeks. Among the Badagas of the Nilgiri hills in southern India, when a death has taken place, the sins of the deceased are laid upon a buffalo calf. For this purpose, the people gather round the corpse and carry it outside the village. There an elder of the tribe, standing at the head of the corpse, recites or chants a long list of sins such as any Badaga may commit, and the people repeat the last word of each line after him. The confession of sins is thrice repeated. By a conventional mode of expression, the sum total of sins a man may do is said to be thirteen hundred. Admitted that the deceased has committed them all, the performer cries aloud, Stay not their flight to God's pure feet. As he closes, the whole assembly chants aloud, Stay not their flight. Again the performer enters into details and cries, He killed the crawling snake. It is a sin. In a moment the last word is caught up, and all people cry, It is a sin. As they shout, the performer lays his hand upon the calf. The sin is transferred to the calf. Thus the whole catalogue is gone through in this impressive way. But this is not enough. After the last shout, Let all be well, dies away. The performer gives place to another, and again confession is made, and all the people shout, It is a sin. A third time it is done. Then, still in solemn silence, the calf is let loose. Like a Jewish scapegoat, it may never be used for secular work. At the Badaga funeral witnessed by the Reverend A. C. Clayton, the buffalo calf was led thrice round the bier, and the dead man's hand was laid upon its head. By this act, the calf was supposed to receive all the sins of the deceased. It was then driven away to a great distance, that it might contaminate no one, and it was said that it would never be sold, but looked on as a dedicated sacred animal. The idea of this ceremony is that the sins of the deceased enter the calf, and that the task of his ablution is laid on it. They say that the calf very soon disappears, and that it is never heard of. 3. The transference to men. Again, men sometimes play the part of scapegoat by diverting to themselves the evils that threaten others. When a Singhalese is dangerously ill, and the physicians can do nothing, a devil dancer is called in, who by making offerings to the devils, and dancing in the masks appropriate to them, conjures the demons of a disease, one after the other, out of the sick man's body, and into his own. Having thus successfully extracted the cause of the malady, the artful dancer lies down in a bier, and shamming death is carried to an open place outside the village. Here, being left to himself, he soon comes to life again, and hastens back to claim his reward. In 1590, a Scotch witch of the name of Agnes Sampson was convicted of curing a certain Robert Kers of a disease laid upon him by a Westland warlock when he was at Dumfries, which sickness she took upon herself, and kept the same with great groaning and torment till the morn, at which time there was a great din heard in the house. The noise was made by the witch in her efforts to shift the disease by means of clothes from herself to a cat or dog. Unfortunately, the attempt partly miscarried. The deceased missed the animal and hit Alexander Douglas of Dalkeith, who dwindled and died because of it, while the original patient, Robert Kerr, was made whole. In one part of New Zealand, an expiation for sin was felt to be necessary. A service was performed over an individual, by which all the sins of the tribe were supposed to be transferred to him. A fern stalk was previously tied to his person, with which he jumped into the river, and there unbinding, allowed it to float away to the sea, 
bearing their sins with it. In great emergencies, the sins of the Raja of Manipur used to be transferred to somebody else, usually to a criminal, who earned his pardon by his vicarious sufferings. To effect the transference, the Raja and his wife, clad in fine robes, bathed on a scaffold erected in the bazaar, while the criminal crouched beneath it. With the water which dripped from them on him, their sins also were washed away and fell on the human scapegoat. To complete the transference, the Raja and his wife made over their fine robes to their substitute, while they themselves, clad in new raiment, mixed with the people till evening. In Travancore, when a Raja is near his end, they seek out a holy Brahman, who consents to take upon himself the sins of the dying man in consideration of the sum of ten thousand rupees. Thus prepared to immolate himself on the altar of duty, the saint is introduced into the chamber of death, and closely embraces the dying Raja, saying to him, O King, I undertake to bear all your sins and diseases. May your highness live long and reign happily. Having thus taken to himself the sins of the sufferer, he is sent away from the country and never more allowed to return. At Uchkurgan in Turkestan, Mr. Schuyler saw an old man who was said to get his living by taking on himself the sins of the dead, and thenceforth devoting his life to prayers for their souls. In Uganda, when an army has returned from war, and the gods warned the king by their oracles that some evil has attached itself to the soldiers, it was customary to pick out a woman slave from the captives, together with a cow, a goat, a foal, and a dog from the booty, and to send them back under a strong guard to the borders of the country from which they had come. There their limbs were broken, and they were left to die, for they were too crippled to crawl back to Uganda. In order to ensure the transference of the evil to these substitutes, bunches of grass were rubbed over the people and cattle and then tied to the victims. After that the army was pronounced clean and was allowed to return to the capital. So, on his accession, a new king of Uganda used to wound a man and send him away as a scapegoat to Bunyoro to carry away any uncleanliness that might attach to the king or queen. 4. The Transference of Evil in Europe The examples of the transference of evil hitherto adduced have been mostly drawn from the customs of savage or barbarous peoples. But similar attempts to shift the burden of disease, misfortune and sin from one's self to another person, or to an animal or thing, have been common also among the civilized nations of Europe, both in ancient and modern times. A Roman cure for fever was to pare the patient nails, and stick the parings with wax on a neighbor's door before sunrise. The fever then passed from the sick man to his neighbor. Similar devices must have been resorted to by the Greeks, for laying down laws for his ideal state. Plato thinks it too much to expect that men should not be alarmed at finding certain wax figures adhering to their doors, or to the tombstones of their parents, or lying at crossroads. In the fourth century of our era, Marcellus of Bordeaux prescribed a cure for warts, which has still a great vogue among the superstitious in various parts of Europe. You are to touch your warts with as many little stones as you have warts, then wrap the stones in an ivy leaf and throw them away in a thoroughfare. Whoever picks them up will get the warts, and you will be rid of them. People in the Orkney Islands will sometimes wash the sick man, and then throw the water down at a gateway, in the belief that the sickness will leave the patient, and be transferred to the first person who passes through the gate. A Bavarian cure for fever is to write upon a piece of paper, Fever, stay away, I am not at home, and to put the paper in somebody's pocket. The latter then catches the fever, and the patient is rid of it. A bohemian prescription for the same malady is this. Take an empty pot, go with it to a crossroad, throw it down, and run away. The first person who kicks against the pot will catch your fever, and you will be cured. Often in Europe, as among savages, an attempt is made to transfer a pain or malady from a man to an animal. Grave writers of antiquity recommended that, if a man be stung by a scorpion, he should sit upon an ass with his face to the tail, or whisper in the animal's ear, A scorpion has stung me. In other case, they thought the pain would be transferred from the man to the ass. Many cures of this sort are recorded by Marcellus. For example, he tells us that the following is a remedy for toothache. Standing booted under the open sky on the ground, you catch a frog by the head, spit into its mouth, ask it to carry away the ache, and then let it go. 
but the ceremony must be performed on a lucky day, or at a lucky hour. In Cheshire, the ailment known as afta, or thrush, which affects the mouth or throats of infants, is not uncommonly treated in much the same manner. A young frog is held for a few moments with his head inside the mouth of the sufferer, whom it is supposed to relieve by taking the malady to itself. I assure you, said an old woman, who had often superintended such a cure, we used to hear the poor frog whooping and coughing, mortal bad, for days after. It would have made your heart ache to hear the poor creature coughing as it did about the garden. A Northamptonshire, Devonshire, and Welsh cure for a cough is to put the hair of the patient's head between two slices of buttered bread and give the sandwich to a dog. The animal would thereupon catch the cough and the patient will lose it. Sometimes an ailment is transferred to an animal by sharing food with it. Thus in Oldenburg, if you are sick of a fever, you set a bowl of sweet milk before a dog and say, Good luck, you hound. May you be sick and I be sound. Then when the dog has lapped some of the milk, you take a swig at the bowl, and then the dog must lap again. And then you must swig again, and when you and the dog have done it a third time, he will have the fever and you will be quit of it. A bohemian cure for fever is to go out into the forest before the sun is up, and look for a snipe's nest. When you have found it, take out one of the young birds, and keep it beside you for three days. Then go back into the wood and set the snipe free. The fever will leave you at once. The snipe has taken it away. So in Vedic times the Hindus of old sent consumption away with the blue jay. They said, O oh, consumption, fly away, fly away with the blue jay. With the wild rush of the storm and the whirlwind, O oh, vanish away. In the village of Wandegla in Wales, there is a church dedicated to the virgin martyr St. Tecla, where the falling sickness is, or used to be, cured by being transferred to a foal. The patient first washed his limbs in a sacred well hard by, dropped fourpence into it as an offering, walked thrice around the well, and thrice repeated the Lord's Prayer. Then the foal, which was a cock or a hen, according as the patient was a man or a woman, was put into a basket, and carried round first the well and afterwards the church. Next the sufferer entered the church, and lay down under the communion table till break of day. After that he offered sixpence and departed, leaving the foal in the church. If the bird died, the sickness was supposed to have been transferred to it from the man or woman, who was now rid of the disorder. As late as 1855, the old parish clerk of the village remembered quite well to have seen the birds staggering about from the effect of the fits which had been transferred to them. Often the sufferer seeks to shift his burden or sickness, or ill luck, to some inanimate object. In Athens, there is a little chapel of St. John the Baptist, built against an ancient column. Fever patients resort thither, and by attaching a waxed thread to the inner side of the column, believe that they transfer the fever from themselves to the pillar. In the mark of Brandenburg, they say that if you suffer from giddiness, you should strip yourself naked and run thrice round the flax field after sunset. In that way the flax will get the giddiness, and you will be rid of it. But perhaps the thing most commonly employed in Europe as a receptacle for sickness and trouble of all sorts is a tree or bush. A Bulgarian cure for fever is to run thrice around a willow tree at sunrise, crying, The fever shall shake thee, and the sun shall warm me. In the Greek island of Carpathus, the priest ties a red thread around the neck of a sick person. Next morning, the friends of the patient remove the thread and go out to the hillside, where they tie the thread to a tree, thinking that they thus transfer the sickness to the tree. Italians attempt to cure fever in a like manner, by tethering it to a tree. The sufferer ties the thread around his left wrist at night, and hangs the thread on a tree next morning. The fever is thus believed to be tied up to the tree, and the patient to be rid of it. But he must be careful not to pass by that tree again, otherwise the fever would break loose from its bounds and attack him afresh. A Flemish cure for the egg is to go early in the morning to an old willow, tie three knots in one of its branches, say, Good morrow, old one, I give you the cold, good morrow, old one, then turn and run away without looking round. In Sonnenberg, if you would rid yourself of gout, you should go to a young fir tree and tie a knot in one of its twigs, saying, God greet thee, noble fir, I bring thee my gout. Here will I tie a knot, and bring my gout into it, in the name, etc. Another way of transferring gout from a man to a tree is this. 
pare the nails of the sufferer's fingers, and clip some hairs from his legs, bore a hole in an oak, stuff the nails and hair in the hole, stop up the hole again, and smear it with cow's dung. If, for three months thereafter, the patient is free of goat, you may be sure the oak has it in his stead. In Cheshire, if you would be rid of warts, you have only to rub them with a piece of bacon, cut a slit in the bark of an ash tree, and slip the bacon under the bark. Soon the warts will disappear from your hand, only, however, to reappear in the shape of rough excrescences or knobs on the bark of the tree. At Berkhamstead, in Hertfordshire, there used to be certain oak trees, which were long celebrated for the cure of ague. The transference of the malady to the tree was simple but painful. A lock of the sufferer's hair was pegged into an oak. Then, by a sudden wrench, he left his hair and his egg behind him in the tree. End of chapter 55 Recording by Monsbro, Helsingfors, Finland